for the last year and a half, I have been living at home with um, um, a father who was diagnosed with brain cancer. And uh, it was in his left frontal lobe, and it left him uh, eviscerated of language. It d destroyed his executive capacities. Um, being uh, the strongest out of uh, my household, I was the one who had to be with him for showers, um, for, for bathroom, I shaved him. We became very physically intimate over the last year of his life, and he, he passed away last month. And one of the things that this experience taught me, not that far on the heels of a service tour in Iraq, at a torture prison of all places, is that pain and suffering happens all over the place. And war is not a particular venue in which you have to make special choices. It's, a, it's in one sense, it's a venue like any other place you could ever find yourself. They're just happening much more rapidly and much more frequently. And some of the things that I learned as, um, as an interrogator at Abu Ghraib, having been there just on the heels of the prisoner abuse scandal and being around soldiers of different stripes, people who had been raised in a religious tradition, some people who had not been raised in a religious tradition, individuals who had been taught uh, dinner table manners. Um, and maybe that was their entire social ethic, is that what you come into war with will dictate how you come out of war. And on the other side of war, you've got an, an array of individuals um, like Camilo, like myself, like the others that you're going to hear. And some of us disagree. We don't necessarily have the same conception of the ethics of war. But we do have, I think, one thing in common that you'll hear resonating through us is that we do have a clear conception of the necessity of ethics and the primacy that ethics must play, whether you're talking about war or whether you're talking about taking care of the terminally ill. We must be profoundly concerned about the decisions that each of us make in times of great inconvenience. Whether that inconvenience is putting on hold something in your personal life in order to care for someone else, or if that means dealing with uh, the ill repute that you might get in your unit. Um, I was at the Vatican two years ago with Tom Cornell, um, who's a commissioner here today, and Mike Griffin from the Catholic Peace Fellowship. And we went to the uh, Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace. And of all the places that we went over this three-week tour of Pontifical Commission after Commission after Commission, it was the Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace that we got the chilliest response from. And one of the things that, that I heard after telling my story of having you know, two friends who committed suicide, one who turned her own M16 on herself because she thought that she had no option but to torture detainees, um, the response that I got from a Monsignor who sat across the table from me was, you signed up. How dare you, you know, come in here and preach to me? I've been getting emails from back home, people chastising me, saying, how can you possibly support a church that has been as critical of the Iraq war as the Roman Catholic Church has been. And um, uh, my friend Mike Griffin was much more eloquent than I was. I was incensed at the moment and I stayed quiet and, and uh, my friend Mike went through a litany. Uh, it was the most eloquent rebuke of a, of a spiritual authority I'd ever heard. And he started with Jesus, ended with Pope Benedict XVI and cited two millennia of teaching that, that showed how wrong he was about his understanding of the role of conscience in war. And the litany went, the church was not with you when. The church was not with you when Jesus spoke on a mount. The church was not with you when Francis de Liguori wrote on war. And he indicated that individuals who are aware that um, an unjust war is taking place if they participate in the war and do not seek to, to extricate themselves from the situation, they should not even be allowed absolution in confession. That's the kind of heightened language 
that one doctor of the church uses to describe the primacy of conscience. And I think another thing that we need to talk about very briefly is what is conscience? What does it even mean to have a conscience? And I think one thing that I learned in my experiences is that there is no such thing as a private conscience. Conscience is inherently social. It is inherently political. You cannot have a personal feeling about a state of affairs and keep it to yourself and call it conscience. In a sense, you're having a, you're having a belief. The, 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 the great situation from the, from the film would be um, it's not so much what you do, but the, the mentality with which you do it. Um, I once had that view, and it was the view that allowed me to go into the military in the first place. I had a very change from within sort of mindset. I thought it would be better to have a person like me in a position of, of, of authority, of grave authority, like an interrogator, than to have somebody who just wants to drop bombs. Um, to have a person like me who's more ethically you know, struggling with issues in those positions. But what I discovered is that the system that I found myself within far exceeded my capabilities as a single individual to make that sort of massive change from within necessary in order to conduct myself in a way that I would not want to then go back to Georgia like my friends did and hang themselves in their barracks room. Because the, the non-abstract realities that my friends and I encountered, we take that home with us in our bodies. And categories like soldier, like politician, like minister, like chaplain, these are all abstractions. There is no such thing as, as a president. There is Barack Obama. There is no such thing as a soldier. There is Joshua Castile. And how I react when my father gets ill is going to have a relationship to how I act when I find myself in a, in a situation of, of mortal danger. At the heart of all of this is a need to realize that what we believe on the inside can never be removed from what we do on the outside. There is no private conscience. And I think what we're trying to do today, and we thank you for being able to be here to dialogue with us, is to say, what does that then mean for legislation? What does that then mean for what we teach kids in schools? For what we teach kids in churches, in mosques, in synagogues, in temples? Because one day they will be in a situation where it will be inconvenient, where people will think badly of them, where their career will have to be on hold, and they'll have to say, I have to make a choice. And I'm going to have to be responsible for that choice, and I'm going to have to be able to live with that choice.